Hello, I'm Clive Nash. Welcome to Let God Speak. In Old Testament times, God made covenants or agreements with individuals and with the nation Israel. In our panel discussion today, we hope to find that Jesus Christ was not only a better sacrifice, but the author of a better covenant too. I invite you to open your Bible and find the letter to the Hebrews. Today, we will learn about Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. To discuss our topic today, we have John Cosmar and Natasha Sewer. Welcome, Natasha and John. Good mm. to have you with us today. But uh, before we begin our discussion, let's take a moment to pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for the Word of God that has been entrusted to us in the Bible. And as we study it today, may we see some new things, some new insights into your plans for us, and particularly with relation to our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. 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 Well, to begin, I'd like to uh, read Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and verse 6. He Hebrews 8 verse 6 has this to say, But now he has obtained, that's Jesus, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better providence. Promises. So, John, um, why why is it a, a better covenant? Clive, when I look at the list, that word should be best <laughs> covenant, because Hebrews makes clear that Jesus never sinned. He lived a perfect life. He had an atoning death, which makes him a better mediator between God and man. Jesus took our place when he died. And so it's not better covenant. It's the best covenant that you could get. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we're using the, the wording of, of Paul here to Hebrews when he says it's better than anything that went before. But I agree. <laughs> He's the best mediator we could Absolutely. ever have, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's go forward a chapter or two to chapter 10 in Hebrews. And uh, I'm going to read verses 5 to 7, uh, which is actually uh, quoting from an Old Testament passage. Hebrews 10, beginning of verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he, that's Jesus, said... Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. So, Natasha, what, what's, what's going on here in, in these verses? So, Paul here is actually quoting um, Psalms. So, he's reading, and I'll read for you. Uh, Psalms 40, verse 6 to 8. And it says these words, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. And your law is written, is within my heart. Now, this is a messianic plan pointing forward to the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. Now, doing his will means obedience to the moral law. So in Psalms, it says your will, your law. It was a delight for Jesus to live a perfect life of obedience. And when we become a, a Christian, it is also our delight to do the same. Mm. Yeah, and, and Paul's almost quoting word for word here, isn't he? Yeah, almost. Um, of course, he would have been quoting from the, the Greek version of the Old Testament. So there, there will be some differences, mm. but, but certainly he's picked up on this messianic idea. Mm. Um, I'd like to uh, just have a look um, at, at the, uh, at, there's another verse, John, I'd like you to share with us in this chapter. And uh, was there anything wrong with the animal sacrifices that came before Calvary? Yes, it was. There were animals that were being sacrificed. And this is where their sacrifice was really of, of no avail 
because verse 4 says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But what they did was they represented that Jesus was going to come and that his blood was going to shed and that he was the one that was going to die for us. And so they were a reminder of what was going to happen. Mm. Poor animals. Yeah, so the efficacy was not the animals so much as to what they pointed to. Absolutely. Um, so was Paul implying, that Tasha, that uh, God had given uh, Israel a, a de- defective covenant? No, it was definitely not a defective covenant. The provision of the priesthood in the Old Testament and the sacrifices uh, that were there had the benefit of keeping Israel from idol worship. Let's read Hebrews 10 verse 1. And it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not of the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So notice right at the beginning, it says the word shadow. Again, we have this idea of the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices throughout the whole Old Testament. And they point towards what was to come. So a shadow of the things that are to come. So we also read Colossians verse uh, 2, verse 17. And here, let me just turn there. And here we, we find something else. It says here, Colossians 2, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Shadow precedes substance. Mm-hmm. Just like when you're standing there, your shadow, if, if the sun is there, the shadow precedes you. So I'm going to quote from the Andrews Study Bible, and it says this. Shadows are transitory, impermanent. For shadows, the author refers to the Levitical priesthood, the earthly sanctuary, and the animal sacrifices, all ritual aspects of the law that prefigured the realities of the new covenant. Okay, there's a familiar verse uh, in John chapter 1, and I, I hardly need to, to turn to it, but in John 1 uh, verse 29, it talks about John the Baptist. He sees Jesus coming, and you know what he said? Uh, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the, the sin of the world. Um, so what text would, would John have had in mind, John, <laughs> when he says this? It was probably Isaiah because we read in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, he was led, and here we come to what we'd said earlier about animals representing Christ. As a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Mm -hmm. He was taken from prison, from judgment, who will declare his generations? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And so just like the animals were slaughtered, we find that Christ was taken and there he made the sacrifice. And I'm very glad that the death of Christ put an end to the slaughter because how many animals would have died in the 2,000 years down to our day mm. if those sacrifices continued? So the death of Christ not only saves us, but has also saved a lot of animals, mm. millions. Mm. Amazing. So, uh, Natasha, Natasha, the law of God, uh, what role does that play then? So there is nothing wrong with God's law. Um, it is still the standard of righteousness. But the law does not give us salvation. So let's read Romans 10 verse 4. And it says this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The word that's used here for end is the word telos. Now telos means an end point. Or as the New International Version puts it, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, this is good news Mm. because this is righteousness for all who believe. Yeah. Um, I'm going to draw your your attention back to Hebrews chapter 8 now. And uh, let's have a look at verses 10 to 12. 
Hebrews, <clears throat> Hebrews 8, verses 10 to 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And then in verse 12, it says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. So, John, is, is this a new idea that Paul's coming up with here? Well, it is for the people in his day because they'd forgotten what the old covenant was. And so here he was renewing it for them. And he was probably quoting the book of Jeremiah, where it talks about this idea of, of getting a new covenant, putting it in your heart. And that came from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm reading from the, the New King James Version, verse 8. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. Because this Lord had been given 40 years before, and now Deuteronomy is saying it. And then when you come to verse 11, for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. So it's right there. And then verse 14, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. It's not only in the mind, but it's also in the heart. Mm. And we have three brains in our system. And the heart is the one where you not only know, but you feel as well. And that is where you are just so glad and you rejoice that you've heard this. Mm. And so the new covenant actually is the old covenant that brings joy. Yeah, this, uh, this word new that uh, uh, Jeremiah uses, um, it can have two meanings uh, from what I've studied. It either, can either mean brand new or it can mean renewed. And, and Jeremiah may have meant both. Um, but what was one of the problems with the old covenant, Natasha? So let's read Jeremiah 31 verse 32. And it says this, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So God did not fail. Israel failed. But when we read the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, we realize that there were always faithful believers. Mm, so, John, so what about individuals then? Individuals. Mm. Um, when you go to Isaiah chapter 51 and read verse 1, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. And then verse 7, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. Here are a group of people who have the law in their hearts. In fact, when you, when you go back to Psalms, verse 37, and there you read verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speak wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. And then verse 31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. And so all down through the ages, there have been those who have rejoiced in the new covenant that they have found mm. when the gospel was revealed to them. Yeah, and certainly Hebrews 11, that actually you're referring to, you know, has a whole list of people who had been faithful to God in Old Testament times. Um, is there also, besides this, um, this renewal, is there also an element of complete newness? in the new covenant, Natasha? Well, again, I want to read Jeremiah 31, verse 32. I know we've just read it, but let's read it one more time. It says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel 
After those days, says the Lord, oh, says the Lord. Yep, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. Now, it would be a different covenant to the people because they had broke the covenant. Jesus is the guarantee of a better covenant. So I just want to read um, back. We're back in Hebrews. And now I'm reading from chapter seven. And it says. Hebrews chapter seven. So this is verse 22 in, in Hebrews you're thinking of, is it? Yes, that's the one. Okay. And it says this, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Now, the author Hewitt says this, the great, the greatness of his person, Jesus, the sufficiency of his sacrifice, the authority behind his resurrection, the superiority of his priesthood and his ascension to the throne of God are a complete pledge of the validity of the better covenant. As the hymn says, that beautiful hymn, Jesus paid it all, all I owe to him. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Mm. Uh, So Natasha, is it easy to remain faithful to Jesus at all times? Let's be honest. It's not always. We fall and we're, we're human and we sin, but God can pick us up. And let's read 2 Timothy 2 now, verse 11 to 13. And it says these words. This is the faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, God is always faithful. Even if we are not, as verse 13 says, these verses continue to say how faithful God is. According to this classic poem uh, written by Alicott in 1897, it says this. Many have supposed from the rhythmic character of the clauses of verses 11, 12 and 13 that this saying was taken from some some of the most ancient Christian hymns composed and used in the earliest days of the faith. So whether it is true or not, what a beautiful and wonderful thought Mm. that God is always faithful And may we be faithful too. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, move on to to the thought that Jesus is uh, a better mediator of the new covenant. I'm going to read again a couple of texts from Hebrews chapter 8. First first of all, verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then down in verse 6 of uh, chapter 8. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better uh, promises. So, John, what what is meant by Jesus' role as a mediator? There are two aspects to the work of mediation. One is it is between you and some other individual and Jesus is the one who's in the middle. Medi, Medi is in the middle. Mm -hmm. But it's also a second concept of being a guarantee. He is the guarantor for the new covenant. And that makes Jesus very precious to us. Mm. The best, (laughs) not just better, Better. but the best once again. Yes, you, you bring back to my mind the fact that my father became a guarantor for me when I was early on in life, in my working life, and didn't have much capital behind me. Mm. <laughs> so he guaranteed that he would, would pay the loan yep. if I failed. Good. I didn't fail him, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so John, another question to you. How did Jesus ratify the new covenant? Hebrews chapter 9, reading verse 15 from the New King James Version. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. He paid the ultimate price Mm. to become our mediator. And then when you go to Hebrews chapter 6 and read verse 19 and 20, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. They're the words of him, aren't they? Mm. Mm. Yeah. We have an anchor. And which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has 
entered for us even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Mm. And so here we, we have Christ as the ultimate mediator. As someone wrote, God desires to see men and women reaching the highest standard and when by faith they lay hold of the power of Christ, when they plead his unfailing promises, they will be made complete in him. Mm. And Mm. that is how salvation comes to us through Jesus. Mm. So, Natasha, just casting our minds back to Old Testament times, uh, Moses was a mediator between God and the children of Israel. Um, in, in what ways was Jesus a better mediator than Moses? <laughs> well, there's at least three ways that we can think of. Jesus ministers in the heavenly sanctuary, not an earthly sanctuary. The second, Moses reflects, reflected the glory of God, but Jesus is the glory of God. And the third, Moses talked with God, but Jesus is the word of God in flesh. And so that is why he is the better mediator. Mm. Mm. Um, just going ahead in the chapter, uh, through the chapters of Hebrews now, and I'm um, turning to Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter of the hall of faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 10, talking about Abraham here, says, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So there's no question that the reward of the Old Testament uh, times was uh, eternal life. Uh, That's the reward of the Old Covenant. Um, And we read read a moment ago of the better promises on the the basis of better covenant. In in what way are they better, John? Or best, as you would say. (laughs) When you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so Christ made the one sacrifice and by that he can take the blood, apply it, and and here we find that we are sanctified, holy, holy, And what a blessing Mm. that God has brought that uh, to us. Yeah. And uh, just to to remind ourselves about the text we read a moment ago in Hebrews 7.22, that he's Jesus, the surety of a better covenant. Um, So, John, can Christians have power to, to live obedient lives? Fortunately, all we have to do is give ourselves to God in the morning. When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 down to verse 22, once again reading from the New King James Version, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are men, to the glory of God through us, who has established us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. When we invite the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, mm. then Jesus can do that, uh, that work in us and through us. Mm. The Holy Spirit is everywhere and is with each of us all the time. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament now and uh, to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36 and uh, again, read verses 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. That's a, that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? Yeah. And he goes on to say, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. This this text has some wonderful promises in it, doesn't it? What, what do you think of it, Natasha? It does. It's there are two 
amazing promises here. And it's very similar to Jeremiah in that the first promise is we're given a new heart, not just a new heart, but a new soft, fleshy heart that can be molded into the way of Christ. And the second promise here is the Holy Spirit's indwelling power. Um, Many of our viewers, many of our listeners will have had that experience of once having a stony heart, but now a soft heart because of being born again. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's almost like a compliment to to say to someone they've got a soft heart, isn't it? It is. You know, a tender heart, you know, and uh, I I think as Christians, we can certainly aspire Mm. towards that kind of uh, attitude, you know, kind of softness of the heart. Don't you think so, John? You know, it's it becomes a very serious thought to think of what Jeremiah says in chapter 3, verse 15. And it says, I will give you shepherds according to my heart. Not only does our own heart and mind change, mm. but then we become shepherds of others. Mm. And we go to them with a heart that is just like Christ, with a mind that is just like his. And and this is where the better covenant becomes the best mm. because you now share it with others Okay, <laughs> and bring him along. Yeah, I'm going to put my final question briefly to you and Natasha. Yeah. You know, when God gave the Ten Commandments, he reminded people that he brought them out of Egypt. What was their, their response? Gratitude. Mm. Gratitude to him. And that's how it should be with us. And I just want to read one last verse from 1 John 4, verse 17 to 19. And it says this, Love has been perfected among us, in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great promise, isn't it? And of course, John was a, really the, the apostle with a loving heart, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Natasha. And John, good to have you with us today and uh, discussing this very important topic. And as usual, of course, we've, we've run short of time, but thank you viewers for being with us today. You know, we can experience the love of Jesus every day. Knowing that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to die for us changes our hearts. As the author of Steps to Christ has put it, the soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. Well, more than that, Jesus will be the pattern for a more abundant life. We're glad you joined us today on Let God Speak. Remember, all past programs plus teacher's notes are available on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Email us if you wish on lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We invite you to join us again next time. God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.